My name's Cosmo Berry, and I think I started in 2018, I can't really remember. 2017 to 2018 was when I started collecting. And I kind of just have always been into true crime. My mother like raised me watching like ID, the ID channel and Criminal Minds and stuff like that. So I was always into it. And one day I was like chilling on my bed and I was, and I was like, can you collect things from criminals? So I looked it up. I discovered this whole hobby and I kind of just like dived into it head first. And um, now I'm here a um, couple, year, couple years later and I'm on this podcast or this channel. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, pretty crazy. Uh, back in 2010, I had no idea that you could write prisoners or people collected things from prisoners or whatever. And it's been like a shock, like almost 13 years later, like fingernails, blood, you know, hair, all this crazy shit. You wouldn't yeah. expect it exists. I, 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 I wanted. I knew that I wanted to collect true crime related stuff. I just didn't know you could collect signatures and stuff. So actually, when I first started collecting, I was collecting things like, this is kind of nerdy, but I used to be really into Legos, and I would literally make like um, custom minifigures based off of like different serial killers and stuff. Like John Wayne Gacy and, and stupid stuff like that. But then I was like, I feel like I could do more. <laughs> so then I discovered the, you know, the, you know, letters and stuff. So that's kind of what I've been doing ever since. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a unique and interesting hobby. Definitely always keeps you on your toes, especially the research, I think, is the most fun aspect of it all. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree. I'm, not too picky on what I collect as long as I don't already have that signature in my collection. So I just like buy in mass, just as many names as possible. I recently, the past year or so, been really into collecting Asian criminals, East Asian criminals specifically, which is what this these two pieces are. And um, I just find it really, it's really hard even to find, even to find a, a um, a like address to send a letter to is difficult in itself and it's just it's fun and whenever you get a new piece it's like it's like it matters because it's so hard to find them it's it you know so yeah it's pretty exciting yeah well it's it's almost like the 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 search and once you get it in your hands is almost like that adrenaline feeling right like you 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 spent what days or weeks trying to get this piece and you finally get it in your hands it's almost like a, an accomplishment of sorts yeah you get that drill and then you want to do it again almost like a criminal <laughs> <laughs> right right exactly all right yeah so speaking of east asian criminals uh, i want to talk about two today um the first being uh is it lam kwok why is that how you pronounce his name that's how i pronounce it i mean if it's pronounced wrong then i've been saying it wrong this whole time but Lam Kok Wei or Wai is how I pronounce it, yeah. And uh, I know that he's he's one of two Hong Kong's, like, confirmed serial killers, right? Yeah, the other one is Lam Kor Wan, the Jars killer. He's more, I'd say he's the more well-known of the two because I think what he did just was, I guess, a little more, not to get into his case because that's not what this is about, but he, like, killed his victims and then would, like, collect... Um, he would like cut off their their lower areas off and put it in jars. And I think because of how graphic it was and stuff, it kind of got more a little bit more traction in the media. So uh, um, were all the victims men then? Sorry? Were all the victims men in that case? Oh uh, no, they're actually women. Oh okay. He, okay. Um, he he cut off like their I can't remember. It's um like their uh, all I remember is it's is it's their lower bit. I can't really remember specific. Was it their vulva? Something like that. Okay, yeah. And he and he cut he would put them in jars and he was a taxi driver. And he would like at night they called him the what is it, the rain the rainy night butcher or something like that, where he would um he would pick up his victims at night when it was rainy. So I guess to to reduce like people seeing him, and he would kill him in his taxi, and then he would collect the jars. So that's why other people call him the Jars Killer. They say um, um, the Lem Kor Wan is he's the more well known one because of the I don't know the graphicness of his crime, 
his crimes. He killed four, uh, I, I want to say they were sex workers. I don't know a ton about his case, but I, I want to say they're sex workers. But I personally think that, not that it's a competition, but I personally think that Len Fok Wei is the worst because he killed three women, but he raped 10 in total. So he has more, he has a higher victim count, you know. Um, he committed his crimes. He started his, his he his first rape occurred in 1992. And basically what he would do was he would like follow women back to their apartments and like trap them in elevators and commit the sexual assault in the elevator as it was like as it's like going up. Very, very uh, it's really really specific, but that's what he did a lot of the times. He's kind of a he's kind of a he stands out a little bit because he's he's definitely a was doing it for the sexual aspect. I mean he all of his victims he sexually assaulted. But it was also it was a combination of that and like the excitement of it. He his whole life he had this thing where he just got bored like oh really easily and he was constantly looking for something to like excite him so first he started out with just like petty thefts and when he was younger and stuff like that and he moved up to you know bigger thefts and kind of moved up to um he actually became a street racer before he started his crimes he was like a like an illegal street racer and by what i read he was really good like really good like he was like infamous for his street racing skills apparently and but that um got not exciting for him anymore so he felt that he needed to up the ante so he started raping victims and that's was in 1992 his crime spree ended in 1995 so like between 92 and 95 was when he was committing you know his crimes what's kind of odd i found out while studying this case is they actually made a movie in 1994 about him so they made a movie about him before he was even arrested. And it's called, um, I wrote it down here, it's called The Rapist in 1994. And I'm not gonna try to n- pronounce like the Japanese versions of these names because <laughs> I would just I'll just kill it. So I'm doing the English versions. But um, yeah, which I found that's interesting. They usually, you hear like, they, they make movies after the criminal has been caught, you know? This guy, they made a movie before he was even caught. So they were like ahead of the ball came with the movies, apparently. But um, yeah, when he was, and uh, you mentioned, um, you thought that his, uh, him calling his hand his fork was interesting. Uh, yeah. I don't really know why he did that. I couldn't really find any information as to why he called his hand his fork. He just like liked to call his right hand his fork. He had, by what I read, he had like unnaturally strong hands. Like he had really a lot of grip strength and he was able to like incapacitate a woman just with one hand like he didn't even need to use both of his hands and so he he got to start using his right hand as is calling it his fork for some freaking reason guy was weird <laughs> but um yeah so i it's a very fascinating case they most people know him now as the um the um they, when he was committing those crimes, the pub, the public called him the sex devil. That was his um, nickname. Most people know him now as a twin month rapist because that was kind of the region that he committed his crimes. He committed his, I don't know a lot about the area, but I know that the area was, the twin month area is a, a poor district of, of like a poor place in Japan. That's where he was born and raised. So yeah, he, he that's what he did. The, um, Letter itself is, I have a letter envelope set from him. It's not anything too exciting. It's just generic, you know, but I didn't get it for the content of the letter. Is it in English or is it in? It's in English. Yeah, it's actually in English. You can tell that he, English is not his first language, but he was able to write it in English. Um, so I don't know if that's easy to see, but... Just a, you know, front page letter. He has pretty good handwriting. Yeah, he, he does. Um, I was reading this letter, and I don't know if this is just what he called it or what's up, but he actually, in the back of it, he said that he gets his money in the form of, like, um, 
let me find it real quick. Euros. He gets us he his salary is five to eight euros, which is interesting because I don't think Euros is I mean I could be wrong. They might do Euros over there. I don't think Euros Euros is like North America, right? Or um, South America, right? Yeah, I thought so. I thought they did like a uh, yen over there or something, didn't they? Yeah. Or like yeah, that's yeah. strange. I thought that I, I don't know if that's just what he calls it, or they do all kinds of they might do multiple types of you know salaries over there or something like that. But I thought that was that was interesting. I don't know what it means, but <laughs> but and here's the um here's the hmm. and the, it came with a card too, but I didn't buy the card. Let me cover up the address there. He put a lot of stamps on it. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> he was making sure it was getting to where it was going. Huh. But yeah, so it's a really interesting case. And you don't see a lot about him online. And I've noticed when I do see stuff about him, people never use the right photo. Like, I've seen like three or four different people used, through random people. Like, there's one photo online where he's holding a, I guess it's a mugshot photo, and he's holding like the, you know, how they hold something in front of him in the mugshot? Yeah, yeah. It has all the information on it. It literally says his name on it. But for some reason people don't see that and they use like every photo but the correct one which is huh, that's funny yeah so it's a really interesting case it i'd be interested to know more like they don't do much about it you know you think they kind of would because it's there are only two circles in hong kong and hong kong is like one of the largest cities in the world but yeah. <clears throat> you so you think you would hear more about it but you know you never know in the hobby some criminals will be talked about 24 7 and some We'll just, you know, yeah, uh, lurking so. in the shadows, like forgotten about. I was just talking to somebody about that the other day. Like, there's so many serial killers in the U.S. that nobody knows exists. You know, like, I just learned about one a few months ago. This guy just randomly called me and was like, "Hey, I'm in prison for four counts of homicide." You know, blah 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 blah. I'm like, this guy's a serial killer. I've never heard of him, and he just randomly reached out to me after getting my number from somebody. Like. It's crazy how many cases, you know, there are like, imagine if there was no media, we wouldn't, we wouldn't know who like John Wayne Gacy is or Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, whatever. Like, it's kind of crazy to think about that. They kind of pick and choose, you know, like what to report on and what not to, it seems too. Oh yeah. I, I really agree. I also find the topic interesting that like, I don't know if there will ever be a serial killer, American serial killer that will gain as much infamy as people like Bundy, Gacy, Manson, I know he's not a serial killer, but, you know, he's a, a famous criminal and stuff like that. You never, I I know it has to do with, like, the time period and the victim counts and stuff, but not that I want a criminal to be that, you know, but I'm right. just saying, like, it's interesting that you never see that again. You'll see, like, for, like, a couple days, the one in California that's uh, killed five people so far, he's shooting people. Yeah, you yeah. Heard that one? Yeah, you'll probably hear him for another couple of weeks and then he'll probably be completely forgotten about. And right. it's like, it's not covered like it used to be or like, you know, it's it's interesting. I think it should be covered more because it helps get gets awareness out. Like people know to, to stay safe. If it's like a serial killer in your local area and it's not talked about, you want to know not to go outside and, you know, so. Right, right. And I mean, there's always that catch 22 is like law enforcement doesn't want to panic the you know, yeah. locals, but at the same time, they deserve to know, like, if people are being randomly picked off or raped and killed or whatever, you know, like, the public deserves to know as scary as it is. Yeah, yeah, but... it's, it's just crazy how times have changed. Obviously, I'm not from that time period, but, like, you know, I read, I read a lot about it and stuff, and it's just differences from how things were treated back then to how they're treated now, you know? Now, all you hear about are, like, school shootings and mass murders and stuff that's happened a lot so yeah i feel like i feel like if if he hadn't have killed himself i feel like israel keys was on his way to gaining that type of infamy not bundy status but he was certainly on his way to like making his way i mean he was in the media every single day it seemed like up until he killed himself yeah he he and his his victim count too is probably pretty high i mean i don't think we we know them all but no all around the united will. states yeah. Another one would be Robert Hansen, the butcher baker. He, I'm surprised he's not as, I've noticed that he's gaining more, like he's becoming more well known, you know, through, I don't know if you watched Dexter, but the very last, the most recent season of Dexter, the, the criminal was based off Hansen and 
and I, I think he is getting a little bit more infamy, but like considering what he did, like how he literally hunted his victims in the wood, you would, woods, you would think he would be like up there with with Gacy and stuff. I mean, there's no other criminal who's done that. So right, you know. right. Plus, there was like a Hollywood movie that somebody famous portrayed him in, right? Oh, uh, the Frozen, Frozen Ground. Ground, right? Yeah, um, I can't remember his name. I'm terrible with names, but yeah, that's a great movie. It's, yeah. It really is. It's a good movie. I highly recommend for all the watchers of this video to go and watch The Frozen Ground. Yeah, it is a pretty but, good movie. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so, back to Land Clock Way. That's about... There's not a ton of information about a, a ton of information about him out there. The thing about Japan is I've been doing a lot of collecting of east asian pieces recently past about a year i've been trying to <clears throat> it's extremely hard <laughs> like even getting addresses is like a, a hassle but you know i i have around 10 separate criminals now and um you i've learned that they do not like to reveal stuff about criminals like they're all about they think they think that if people find out about these types of criminals it's embarrassing or like messes up their honor so they kind of try to like push it all under the rug yeah you know? yeah so finding information on some of these people is not easy and even like this is not a real number but it seems like 90 percent of their criminals aren't even known the only ones that are known are the ones that gained a lot of you know media it's not like it is in america where you could just pull up your phone and just like google anybody you want it's not like that you know it's finding information is like it's a hassle and writing them is and it's all it's pretty difficult but um in his case Lim, in Lim Fox way and I have trouble saying his name in his case um not a lot of information I had to watch a couple videos go through a bunch of articles just to get the information that I have you know um and he but he's not Japanese he's he's Hong Kong and Hong Kong is a I don't know how to describe it, but it's part of China. It's like a territory or whatever for China. And um, in the second case we got going, I have here. I'll show. Case. Yeah, how do you say it? Is a, it? I'm I'm Shen Rikio. Is that how do you say it? Shen. <laughs> again, I think I'm uh, I'm Shen Rikio. Yeah, I think it's that's how I say it. Um, he. It's a very. There's a lot of. No, this is not one of those cases that doesn't have a lot of information. You can find all kinds of stuff about this case. Like, you could write a book. <laughs> but so I can't go through everything, obviously. But um, I've acquired a couple pieces relating to. If I can open it, relating to that case, I have this, which I got kind of recently. I try not to get too much on Fumikio stuff because there's you can actually find. His stuff is Arm Shunrikyo and Issei Sagawa are the two easiest Asian criminals to get things from. You can, if you have the money, you can find, you know, right. stuff from them. And um, this is a pretty large newspaper mm -hmm. that was published, I guess, you know, during the time of the case. As him on right there. I have that just folded up over here. And I have a at home, um, I just call it like an at home shrine sticker type thing. Well, I pulled this up here. It's basically, here we go. Hmm. This is a really cool piece. So this one is unused, it still has the backing, it's a sticker. Basically, what you do with it, if you were part of that cult, you would find a location in your house, stick it on the wall. And then you would set up like a little shrine around it. And that's kind of where you would pray to to the cult, <laughs> do whatever that cult was doing, you know? And um, that's a pretty, it's on you. So it's it's pretty cool piece. Uh, um, just to give some information on the cult for the people who have never really heard about it out there. Um, it's formerly, it was formerly called On Trinicchio. Now it's called Alec. They've kind of had to distance themselves from. I'm sure. I'm sure they still worship um, Shoko Ashihara, who is the founder of the cult. I'm sure they still re review. He was him, the one but, that like led like the subway attacks, right? With with yeah, with his was, followers or whatever you want to call them. Is 
Exactly. He was a bad guy. And so I feel like they've kind of recently been trying to distance themselves from, from him, that chapter of the cult. So now they call themselves Aleph or Aleph or, you know, something like that. Um, back in the day, Shoko Ashihara got the idea to found a doomsday cult in 1987. And um, they did all kinds of crime. It wasn't, they're most well known for their terrorist attacks. But they did all, all kinds of stuff, like killing people who spoke out against them. You would not want to spoke out. During the 1980s, it would be a bad time to, to say anything negative about this cult because they were very willing to come and kill people because they did. They definitely did that. And um, what, was the, total, what was their like method of murder? Was it just like shootings or was it anything like crazy? <sighs> It varied. It, they didn't really have a specific method. They just killed people, you know, shootings, stuff like that. They were just worried about keeping their name in the positive light. So they did whatever they had to do to get rid of people. Like the most well-known case in that aspect is I don't know all the details, but a man I think was, I'm sure somebody out there knows more about this, but I think was speaking out of, against him and something to the effect of um, Shoko sent some of his minions and they went and ended up killing his whole family, him and his family, stuff like that. They they were very willing to do that. So he didn't want to speak out against the cult. And, um, but what they're most, most well known for is the Tokyo subway sarin attack and the Matsumoto sarin attack. Basically, they... Um, decided they wanted to get their revenge against society or whatever. All cults kind of have the same type of ideology, just worded differently. And um, But they did it in a very peculiar way. They use sarin gas. And I'm sure a lot of people know what sarin gas is, but it's very unhealthy for you. <laughs> and um, they're actually the very, in, if I can remember correctly, they're actually the very first documented cult to actually use a gas attack and, and kill people mm -hmm. with it like that and they um sadly were very successful in it they ended up um in total i don't know this the, um, i don't know the exact victim count like of both of them individually but i know in total they killed 27 people with that and ended up injuring over six thousand others so they were very they they made an effect in, J in japan um and actually their effect is still seen today because I, this is a kind of a little known fact that is, is kind of neat. If you ever go to Japan, you'll notice that there are not a lot of trash cans around the area. It's very hard to find trash cans. They have them, but they're just in designated spots, very spread apart, and you have to search for them. The reason for that is this cult, because after they committed their crimes, I guess Japanese authorities kind of thought that this might spur other terrorist attacks of the same nature. And those terrorists might put their bombs up in trash cans. So they greatly reduce the amount of trash cans that are actually around the city. And still to this day, that's still a thing that's happening. Like they make sure that there are not a lot of trash cans. It's 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 really random, but it's it's neat, you know. And, um, and then and they were all like him, the the leader and like his minions were executed just a couple of years ago, right? 2018. I actually remember like I said. 2017 or 2018 was when I got into the hobby. I can't remember the exact date, but I want to say early 2018, maybe. And I actually remember like reading that recently because I actually had the idea maybe I would write him or whatever. And when I look, looked him up to get more information, it was like he had died. He had been executed like really recently. And I was like, well, that's, well, I guess I won't write him, <laughs> you know, but um, yeah, so. In total, 13 people were executed. Um, six of them were executed at one day, and then the rest were executed at the later day. Within that six was Shoko Ashihara. Um, highly recommend. If I went, if I tried to jot down all the notes of that of this cult, I would be sitting here talking for like an hour. Right. So, right. You know, but I, I highly recommend anybody who hasn't heard of it to go out and um read more about it because it's fascinating it's a very infamous cult um the most infamous cult from japan so it's definitely worth a read if you like true crime you know i thought it was pretty interesting i, I looked up that you know like most cult leaders like 
you know, to take credit for everything, but it, it seemed that before his execution, he like maintained that he was innocent and downplayed everything. He was not a cult leader and everything, which is kind of interesting to me. Like he knew he was going to die and like denying this cause that he created. Like, it's kind of interesting to me that he just was like, eh, whatever. Yeah. I could see him wanting to downplay it and stuff. A lot of cult, I, I don't know if he thought that maybe if he tried to downplay it, make people believe that he wasn't involved in the crimes as people thought he was, then he might get off on a lighter sentence or not get executed. But at the end of the day, everyone knew that he was the one who did it, you know, and he needed to be executed. In Japan, oh, this is another little neat fact, is the way that the death row works in Japan is basically if you're on death row, they don't tell you when your due date is basically like when the date that you're going to be executed, they don't tell you that. They tell you that like a day before or the day of. They usually tell you the day of. They'll just come to your cell, say, hey, it's your time and then take you and execute you. You won't even know. Mm. So, and they kind of like to do it in groups too. So like they'll take like three people. Jeez. Like, Su yeah, Sutomu Miyazaki the rarest piece in my collection is one of my Asian pieces. The otaku killer, um, he was executed in, um, shoot, 2007? 2008, I want to say, 2008. And him and two other criminals were just taken one day. Where they were like, yeah, that's your time. And they hung up. And they they still hang people in, in Japan. That's, that's you know, they, they haven't gotten past that either. So it's a very... I don't know. I don't know what would be better knowing when your time is to to be killed or not. Both are kind of bad, but you know, right. it's, it's like that's just what they do, and um, that's what they did with with um, Shoko Shahara. They in twenty eighteen they took him and executed him, and um, I can't say that he didn't deserve it. You know, I don't want to get onto the topic of if execution is right or wrong. But if anybody deserved to be executed, I mean, you know, <laughs> Shankar Shahar is a pretty good candidate. Right, right. And wasn't he supposed to be, he was supposed to have been executed like years earlier. And then there were members of the cult or something that were arrested, right? Which delayed his execution. Yeah, yeah I heard that. I didn't really lie into that. But um, yeah, members of the cult were continuing to do cult things after he was arrested. And um, because they're they're called still around. There was a lot of people in the call, like like yeah, I read there was something as recent as like 2019, some guy ramming his car or something mm -hmm. like that, where he was like a sympathizer of the cult or something like that. Or mm -hmm. when they were just just with the people that they arrested, not this is not like the total number, but just with the people that are arrested, they arrested 192 people. So and that was just the ones that they thought were involved. They're all it's a large cult and it's still going on. They just have to be careful because in a lot of countries including the united states they're they're counted as a terrorist organization actually so they're like red flagged everywhere so they're being watched constantly so they have to be careful and that's why they're trying to you know like distance themselves from shuko so they don't get all arrested again or something on but um yeah it's an it's a very interesting case this is like i said this and this sagawa are the two easiest cases to get pieces from if you want to start collecting Asian pieces. So you can go out and find those. Um give Cult Collectibles a little shout out. He he tends to have a lot of um Antronikyo stuff on his that's where I got my stuff. And um Issei Sagawa, you can just find him, you know, I, I mean you can find him. He's, he's not that hard to find. It's just expensive. Yeah, so yeah gotta, I was gonna I was gonna say I have quite a few pieces of Sagawa on my website. They're easy to get, but just not not yeah. super price, not, not super, um, you know, cheap. Like you have I have a drawing cash. that was in manga, you know, one of the manga books and it's beautiful. I think I have it up for like 15, 1600, something like that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, my piece was actually, I got it for a good price. Um, I have a double signed victim photo from him and I got that for $800 and that's a good price. Oh damn. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, but if you, if you have the means to do it, I definitely recommend because he's getting real old. And I think he mentioned recently, once he passes, all of his stuff is going to like 
Yeah, she places he's been a vegetable for years, it seems like, you know, like Yeah, his, his brother's taking care of him, I think. Yeah, yeah, like he doesn't have any arms or legs or something like that, right? He's basically just bed down. Yeah, he he's bed down. He's 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 I, I don't think he's going to be on this earth for much longer. He's just real sick. Yeah, no um, more signing autographs or taking photos with his fans. <laughs> oh yeah, I I heard he hasn't done any of that in quite a while. Yeah. Um so if you're thinking about getting something from him, I would do it now or soon because this stuff is already expensive, but when he dies, it's going to be, you know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. yeah, you're probably looking at a couple grand just for like a signed book or something when he dies. Yeah. Like yeah. Gacy, like Gacy probably, painting prices. <laughs> uh, like Dahmer level. Yeah. You see all this, seeing all this Dahmer stuff. That'll be probably around the price. That's cigar stuff is going to go for pretty soon. So I would definitely jump on, jump on it when you can. Right, um, and I don't know. I I collect East Asian pieces. There's just something about. It. I don't know if I'm just. I don't want to say bored, but I, I mean I live in America, so I constantly read about American cases. I don't know if it's just since it's a foreign country, the cases seem crazier to me, seem more interesting, or they just are crazier and more interesting. If you ever have the time to do it. Look up some of those Japanese cases because there are there are some wild ones. Like I, those people over there are <laughs> they like the murder of Junko Furuta, this famous one. Mm. Um, she, she was the one who was tortured and put in a barrel of concrete after she passed away. And you know, in China, there's the or Hong Kong, there's the um, Hello Kitty murder. Yeah, I was just I was just gonna say I, I I've I've heard of that. That's yeah, one of the most messed up crimes like I've ever read about. Yeah, yeah, it's they. I don't know, or the the Kobe, um, the Kobe. How what do they call it? The um, the Kobe schoolboy or the Kobe school murders or the Kobe massacre. Basically, like a fourteen year old boy was real messed up in the head, and he decided that he wanted to start killing people. So he killed a young girl and a young boy. And the young boy, he beat him or he killed him. And he actually decapitated him and put a note taunting the police in his mouth and then set his head in front of a school. So, yeah, there are some crazy stuff like that. I would highly recommend going. And even the, uh, I hate to bring him up again, but even the otaku killer, Satomi Miyazaki, very fascinating case. Um, he has a, if you like anime, you know, stuff like that. His case is heavily revolved around that. He almost, he is almost the sole reason as to why otaku culture in Japan is, it's it's better now. It's been getting better over the years. But back in the day, he almost completely killed otaku culture just by himself. Like, for a while, whenever you identify it as an otaku, people would compare you to Satomu. You were like, oh, you're otaku, then you're Satomu. So it was very, he almost killed a whole culture in Japan. So that's crazy. Yeah. There's a lot of, yeah. there's a lot of interesting foreign cases. Like even, even outside of Asia, you got like Alexander Pachushkin, you got you oh, know, yeah. uh, Andre Chikatilo, Ivan Millet, the Snowtown mm -hmm. murders. I mean, Ian Brady yeah. and the Wests. I mean, the, so many that are like slept on, but in America, yeah. of course, like a serial killer is like, you know, uh, just like as average like as a mass shooter but over there of course serial homicide or mass shootings are like super rare especially if there's like yeah. no guns right <laughs> yeah um or like um i've been seeing a lot of neil's hogle stuff recently hmm. they call him the oh what is his nickname i know i actually got a piece from him and a package i bought from you um he's a, he's a pretty cool case um yeah supposedly or, one of the most like prolific serial killers in german history right yeah, he he killed. He's convicted of eighty five murders. They call him Resuscitation Rambo because he was a angel of death, and he would um do what angels of death do, and people he would basically you know make his patients real sick, and then he would put on a show for his fellow coworkers and try to resuscitate them. He got to the point to where his coworkers called him Resuscitation Rambo. And when it came out that he was actually killing these people, he, that nickname just kind of stuck. But he was convicted of 85, but I think he's suspected of like 
three hundred, something like that. Um, a lot, a lot. So um, he's extremely prolific. Either way, right, and, um, right. Um, yeah. So you know, I try not to stick within the United States because I know a lot of collectors, and it's totally okay that they do this. But I'm just saying, I know a lot of collectors that kind of like to stick within the United States. And I, my viewpoint is like, there's a whole world of like criminals and crazy stuff. And why would I limit myself to one location, you know? When you right. Get, you know, so that's what, I've, that's what I've been kind of doing. I've been doing, been collecting East Asian or been collecting foreign pieces for, I've always been interested in foreign criminals. So I've been collecting them ever since I started collecting. But yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. I know they're a lot more hard to get and like, I mean, there you have less competition of people trying to snatch them up, so that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah. know where to look. <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, they um, they're extremely hard to get. They're just in some like um, Asia or even Russia are the some you know really hard. They're extremely difficult to get items from pieces from the especially Russia. Um, the the basically the in prisons the wardens and stuff they don't have to send they don't actually it's it's not like a law to where they have to give the letter to the criminal so if they don't like the letter they just chuck it <laughs> you know and if uh, i was told one time that in russia specifically if they can tell that you aren't a lot of times if they can tell you aren't actually russian then they'll just throw away your letter you know mm -hmm. they, they'll never even get to the criminal so you know it's it's hard but when you get them when you get that piece that you've been searching for for so long it's like you know but yeah i, I had i had one uh alexander petushkin letter at one point in time and i wow. regret getting rid of it to this day like I, I mean i got a pretty penny for it but like man i wish i still had that petushkin piece because it's oh like, you should have kept grail. that man yeah yeah it's definitely a holy <laughs> grail like I, i've had i've had a few russian serial killer letters that i'm like just why did I sell it? I mean, I, I don't regret it at the time, like making that money, but it, you know, it's like, man, because like you said, you know, I could, I could probably send a hundred letters to the same dude and probably wouldn't get any of them. Because I mean, yeah. especially with Google Translate, like they know, like you're like mm -hmm. some American trying to write to some killer in Russia. Like I, I think I, I don't think they probably know like what murder Billy is, but I'm sure they probably have an idea. Like some Americans writing our most prolific killer like in this country <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's probably a little suspicious to them um <laughs> so yeah you that's cool that you had alexander i, I don't even think i've ever seen a piece of him yeah, yeah yeah it was pretty interesting i mean of course it was always like written in russian but yeah it was definitely interesting and in, in seeing like seeing their stamps and their envelopes and stuff is pretty you know interesting because yeah. some countries were like what is it an aerogram will like you're like fold it down and it'll like it's almost like a little thing and you like seal it up. Yeah. I think those are pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, yeah, the envelopes in from Asian are really small. From Asian places, they're really small. They're like, they could fit pretty easily fit inside a normal American envelope. And they, you're, when you're writing out letters to, I don't know about other countries. I just know in Asian places like Japan, you actually have to like put the, you're supposed to put their address on the front and then your address on the back and for some reason i don't really know why but that's just what they do so you know and um it's it's extremely difficult it's just i mean not just asian a lot of places like like you said russia and um um australia i've i've gotten um i got a response from australia one time and i mean it's easier because you can just write in english so right. you know <laughs> um yeah i it's i don't know man this this hobby is a crazy one it's i'm trying to get like i don't know more well known within the within the community i'm trying, right, to, I'm right, trying to get right. my name out there and um, it's not easy because <laughs> no, no i mean i've been i've been at this for like 13 years now and it's just yeah like i mean there's there's new killers all the time and new high profile cases all the time so like unfortunately you know murder is always going to happen so there's always new pieces to collect and acquire and exactly like never ending you know it's like just like the healthcare field will always need jobs it's like unfortunately people are always going to be killing people and 
mm-hmm. being fucked up to one another. So we'll have nothing but, you know, time to write and collect and, you know, whatever, study up on these people. Exactly. I've come to the harsh truth that um, if you want to get a name in the hobby, you have to get the big expensive names. Here, yeah. Here. Yeah. That is true. That is true. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, yeah. there's, a, I mean, there's some guys that have like six, seven, eight, nine Gacy paintings and yeah, I know. And I, this, but some of them I, are I like 50, 60 years old. I've been doing this for like 20, 30 years, you know, so. <laughs> exactly. You have to stand out from the crowd or you're just not going to be noticed. So, right. so I'm always trying to get the crazy pieces, you know. I, I want a Gacy art piece, but I don't know, man. That, it's expensive. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've had three Gacy's over the years, and I, I regret selling each and every one. But, yeah, man, especially the the framing gets expensive, too. The custom, I think I probably paid, like, $500 or so a piece just Ooh. to frame the Gacy's, you know. Like, when I mean, you're talking mat, all that, you know, labor and all that shit. So, it's. Yeah. But, With, I, I just can't. I just can't dole out like three thousand dollars. The most expensive piece I bought was my otaku, and it was about a thousand dollars. So mm. that was about the cap for me. <laughs> After that, I was like, my pockets are hurting. I can't do. I can't do this again right now. Yeah, but, um, yeah. I think I think the most I've ever spent on something was Dahmer, but it was it was like a pornographic card. It was to Jason Moss, you know, the last uh, victim author, and it was like a pornographic card where it said "Happy Birthday" and. It was a dude with a dick and the dick was like long in the card. And there was like a type of letter envelope said, I think I paid like two grand for both of those. And that was like Did you? six, seven years ago. And before there was any Dahmer on the scene. Yeah. Um, you, the way to do it is um, payment plans and trades. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That definitely is the way to do it. I'm pretty flexible with a lot of people, you know, when it comes to payment plan, but there's, I know there's some people that are weird and like they want all the money up front or they just don't want to deal with you. And I mean, yeah. like I'm pretty open and like, as long as people communicate with me, like, Hey, I'm going to be late, like a week late or a few days late, whatever, like that's cool. But you know, payment plans are, are good to me. Yeah, exactly. It's unless you have all the money to spend in the world, that's, that's, that's basically what you got to do. Payment plans and trade, get up, right. get up for the new collectors, get up, bulk pieces a lot of them or get a bunch of names like gacy ramirez warno names like that names that you could hypothetically afford put them on one pile and offer them as a trade for one piece that's 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 how you get that's how i got my bundy piece so i didn't buy yeah anything. i did that years ago i i traded a ted bundy handwritten envelope for like what was it like half of this dude's collection and this oh, was like wow. 2014 or 2015 and as much as I regret getting rid of the Bundy, like I still have a lot of this stuff to this day. You know, I had like Joseph Paul Franklin drawings, Joseph Paul, Paul Franklin letters and, you know, Anthony Sowell drawings and letters and just the most randomest shit was in that lot, like Colin Ferguson art and just yeah. random, yeah. random stuff that I was selling like $50 drawings here, $200 drawings here. And like, you know, so yeah, those, those high end trades will net you mm-hmm. out a lot if you, play your cards right exactly the i've been right now all of the Dahmer stuff going is from cult collectibles and i mean it's understandable but he's not able to trade because it's through like a third party and stuff but right um i was able to pick up one of those a salad fork from his i don't know if you were able to pick up any of the utensils but um he was selling he he ended up with as part of the basement collection i think is what that he was selling um, Dahmer's utensil set that he was using in his Oxford apartments. Oh, he was selling wow. those those pieces individually, and I was able to get a salad fork. Um, but uh, a signature, I have I've been wanting a signature. He he was giving me deals on and stuff, but even with deals, they're just so pricey. I just can't. Yeah, you know. yeah, it is. It's sometimes it's really hard. Like you see something that you want, like do should i get this or should i let my car get repoed and this this and this or what's most important <laughs> <or no? laughs> yeah mean, do i want do i want to lose my house or do i want a Dahmer signature you know <laughs> yeah yeah priorities priorities <laughs> but uh, um well, that's what the talking would do to you it'll suck you in and then you'll start you spending all your money and you don't even know it next thing you know you have no money and then you have like 50 pieces and you're like well i get you know. exactly exactly but i mean the, the good thing about this stuff is nothing really loses value unless it's like a 
like a BTK kind of deal where like at first you're spending like five hundred dollars for a letter, then all of a sudden this dude's writing yeah. everybody, you know. I mean, like I mean, like the good thing is is when these well, when these people pass away, obviously it goes up in value with any celebrity signature or whatever, you know. That was, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up because I noticed that. I thought that was really interesting how when I first started in collecting, BTK stuff was not cheap. I mean, it was it was pretty pretty pricey. And um, now you can get a... I've seen BTK piece itself for like 20 bucks before. Yeah, I know a oh, dude like, that spent $500 on a prison letter envelope set in like 2015. <laughs> and now, like I sold one last week for like maybe i think it was like 85 dollars. it was like a three-page letter envelope set oh gosh <laughs> it's, it's crazy you know like i mean i'm sure people probably thought that like with gacy or like you know like when when he was executed like people were buying his letters mm-hmm. and then this letter pops up this letter pops up then like hundreds of paintings pop up you know mm-hmm. i'm sure it's a shock sometimes like you know all this shit pops up years later or even you know whenever yeah it's interesting how stuff fluctuates. For some reason, uh, recently, you well, you you have a large Krista Pike collection. You said, yeah, um, and I've been seeing a lot of Krista Pike stuff recently. And I don't know if it's just random, just a coincidence, or people think that her execution date's coming up. Because I know that they, um, I know that I was talked about in the news for a little bit, like her execution date. Something about her execution date. I'm not entirely for sure, but for some reason, I've been seeing a lot of her stuff, and her stuff has been kind of going up in price. Especially like her art and stuff has been. I remember at, at one point you it was actually like. I mean, it wasn't like impossible, but you actually had to kind of look for her stuff like a little bit, take a couple minutes because now you can find it everywhere and people are standing and it's like, I don't know if it's just coincidence or what, but you always got to watch out for that. You see in the news, um, well, so and so died, Rodney Alcala, for example. Right. Um, then you'll see the next day people posting stuff about him and posting their pieces and their signatures and stuff. And Shit, her Molin just a few weeks ago just died, you yeah. know, and and I got the, the next day he after he passed away, I traded some stuff for a whole bunch of Molin stuff and nobody I, I could never sell Molin when he was alive. Now I've probably sold four or five pieces in the past week. You know, yeah, it's kind of weird how that works. Exactly. Um I have a couple Molin pieces and I mean I don't plan on selling them, but um it's there for a while you could get them so cheap so cheap and now his stuff is averaging around a hundred dollars i've seen a lot of his stuff yeah Um, so it's just it's really neat it's to see how things it's like this hobby has its own like stock market or whatever how things just fly up and down and yeah it is it is pretty funny i mean at the end of the day not only murder billia but like say something at the store like something's worth what one is willing to pay like a, a john wayne gacy painting like if i offer you 1900 dollars cash money like you'll either take it or you won't but like that's what somebody's willing to pay for it at that moment in time like will you take it or will you not that's the million dollar question <laughs> exactly it's it's definitely makes for selling pieces odd and back to krista pike when she um eventually i don't know if she'll ever get executed but if she does you got yourself quite a little stack of money there to... yeah yeah i'm definitely sitting on a little gold mine here for sure <laughs> yeah um i've been i have a couple pieces from her but you have like boxes of stuff like yeah almost almost 13 years worth of stuff i mean i mean a, with a lot of people at that like jablonski i mean of course he passed away in 2020 but i mean jablonski chester turner you got robert bardo wayne henley mm-hmm. like take your pick I, I have so much from so many people that i've yeah just not even corresponded over the years i've just bought collections and like 20 Bardo letters are in here, 40 Wayne Henley letters are in here, and I can't even give them away. All. Exactly. Uh, I can't do Jablonski. That guy was gross, dude. I'm sorry. Some of the things I've seen from him online, I even the like letter I own, I hesitate to touch. It's just like, <laughs> he just like triggers my germophobia. Like, hardcore. oh, yeah, yeah. Speaking of that, when I went to go visit him the very first day, his hand had open sores everywhere so we went to like shake my hands so i i went like this so i like shook his arm like that because i'm like there's no way i'm touching this motherfucker's hand because like you could tell there was like like he was picking at it when i went to go like he was like picking at his hand and like peeled a piece of skin back and i'm like i'm not shaking this dude's hand 
<laughs> so he, was, gross. he was gross yeah he was food all in his beard and yeah, yeah and like uh like i've seen like q-tips with like his earwax and stuff for sale have you ever seen i've seen crap like that it's like it's like why does that even uh, for sale yeah <laughs> but yeah it's... put that somewhere <laughs> Yeah, pubic hairs and dick tracing and, <laughs> and all that. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah there, there's a market for everything in murderabilia, like even human blood, <laughs> dried blood. People will buy it. People will. I mean, I'm I'm over here joking about it, but people will buy it. You know. Oh yeah, I mean, I've sold plenty of like penis tracings and mm. Jeremy Jones, the redneck Ted Bundy. I had his yeah. AIDS yeah. DNA, you know, semen. Uh, dick tracing on there that I sold for like 150 200 dollars which is just crazy that but <laughs> people will people will buy it <laughs> yeah it's I don't know it's it's interesting to see what goes up for sale um it's this hobby isn't for everyone it's whenever I tell people about it it's very hit or miss people either think it's really cool and want to know more or they think I'm a weirdo and do not want to talk about it <laughs> right you know, right like, yeah that's the general consensus really I mean, yeah, either, it's, it's either interesting or like get the fuck away from me kind of deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, it, that's real true. That's real true. I, like my coworkers are like, "Whoa, that's cool! Tell me more. Did have you gotten a response today?" And I'm like, right, "No, not right. today." But but <laughs> I've had some people where I like like <laughs> my sister, for example, actually thinks I'm really weird for doing it. Like she does not like the fact that I. I don't talk about it around her because she just judges me hardcore. <laughs> That's how my like family myself, used to be. Yeah, my self confidence goes whenever <laughs> I talk about it with my sister. But That's um, hilarious. Yeah, so it's uh, I, but I I think people should shouldn't be afraid to get in the hobby. You know, it's it's there's a lot more people who collect than you would think. It's just it's kind of all underground. Like, you know, it's not like talked about, you know, outside of the hobby, it's not really talked about. Right. And, um, um, but I've helped a couple over the years. I've helped a bunch, you know, people kind of with their get their foot in the hobby, you know, and um, it's, it's, I hate, there are so many scammers and stuff. Like, actually, I, I mean, you know, I feel like everybody gets scammed. It's probably like hazing. Like, if you haven't get, gotten scammed, you're you haven't been in the hobby for long enough. But um, yeah, yeah, it's happened to me time and time and time and time again. But it, it yeah. doesn't happen to me anymore because I know not to exactly. send money like friends and family to somebody <laughs> I don't know. Or like exactly after a couple hundred dollars worth of being scammed, you you learn what to look for. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. And, definitely. and who to trust? Right. Um, my very first time I ever got scammed was <laughs> speaking of Dahmer. It was actually. A, I was like so new in the hobby. I wasn't even like probably a couple months in the hobby. I don't know, something like that. And it was one of those fake, I don't know if you've ever seen them, but you've ever seen the fake Dahmer hand tracings mm. where he puts like Jeff Dahmer at the top and yeah. some quote relating. Yeah, I got one of those and I posted it and everybody was like, that is fake, dude. <laughs> you got scammed. And I'm like, ah, dang, right in the heart. Yeah, yeah, that's always not a good feeling, and it's a, it's it's even a a harder harder feeling to like tell somebody that it's fake. You know, is like you don't yeah. you don't want to be the person that's like, hey, you just threw away two thousand dollars. Like, yeah. that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's it's always um fun calling out scammers though because they get so triggered with you. Like, oh yeah, definitely. They'll say the wildest things to you. I had one guy like year or so ago uh, or maybe even longer i can't remember but I, I called him out on a piece and he was like you don't know who i am little boy and saying stupid crap like that and i'm, and I'm like dude stop <laughs> and then i instantly tell everybody that he was a scammer and he got like blocked from all the groups <laughs> but um, yeah that's how uh, it usually works i mean murder billy is such a small you know exactly. knit community it's like if if you fuck up everybody's gonna hear about it yeah. like overnight. you fucked up you fucked up yeah yeah because um, it's like i've always thought of it as like there's a select few people within a small circle that you know you know each other and you trust each other and you freely trade and buy because you know that you're not going to get scammed but then you have 
the outside circle. And these are all the people that are either just getting into the hobby or are scammers. And there's a lot more of them. And you kind of have to like pick and choose, you know, figure out who is on the outside of the circle or who's on the inside. You know, there are obvious ones like you or cult collectibles or super not or, you know, people like that who are obviously all legit. But then actually today I had to, um, I'm co-admin with in Serial Obsessive. Uh, give a little shout out there. Anybody who heard of that, go give them a follow. And today I actually had to remove a post because I, I asked you. Yeah. You remember the, um, the, oh, the, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Richard I Kuklinski. Yeah. yeah. I was like, did you sell me for like, I can't remember, like $1,700 or something? And I was like, that looks sketchy. I have sketch written all over it. So I asked um, you and I asked, um, well, uh, I asked Jay Downs. Jay Downs. And uh, he's another legit guy. And um, um, you said, I'm pretty sure you said you weren't, you weren't for sure, but um, Jay Downs straight up said um, he, I mean, he didn't 100% say it was fake, but he was like, that doesn't look legit to me. And I was like, removed from the post because anytime there's even any shadow of a doubt, you know, it, more often than not, it's fake. Right, because, right, uh, right. Yeah. And who wants to, be the one that gets caught or gets got for like $1,700. That's definitely yeah. not a good feeling, especially like if, if you're on a payment plan at that or something like that. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, piece of advice, um, newer collectors. If you have, if you have doubts, just pass, you know, you, <laughs> you know, if you, if there's ever something about it, that's like, is that real or not? Just, just, pass. yeah. If it's too good to be true, it, it yeah. usually is. <laughs> exactly. Like you're never going to see a Gacy painting for like, Three hundred dollars, four hundred dollars. If someone's offering you a Gacy painting for four hundred dollars, it's fake. You know, the last Gacy uh, painting that sold for under a grand, like a year or two ago, was fake. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was yeah. laying around somebody's house for a while. I think they, I think it was like eight hundred dollars actually, and it was a yeah. new collector, and she got her money back like almost instantly oh. after she posted it on Instagram, and everybody was like, "Yeah, that does." It was a Pogo the Clown painting, like it looked super cool. It just wasn't one that Gacy did. Like it looked better than a Gacy, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm speaking from experience. That Jeff Dahmer piece I got was like two hundred dollars. I, I didn't know at the time, but you're not gonna find a Jeffrey Dahmer signature for two hundred dollars. You just not. Yeah. So, yeah. That's... Yeah. So you know, it's um, it's a cruel, cruel hobby sometimes. But if you get in with the good collectors and you learn over, over the years, you'll, you'll do fine. You know, I just hate people. I've seen it a couple of times. I hate it when someone tries to get into the hobby, gets screwed over and then leaves, like it gets like scared right. from getting the hobby. I hate to see that because you always want to see your hobby grow, you know, like more followers for pages, more, you want to see more people buying and selling. Cause not only is it just good, that's more product out there that you might get lucky on a piece, you know? And right. It's always um, terrible to see people get scared from getting the hobby because they got scammed for the first time, but you just got to stick it out, you know, and you do good. That's what I did. You know, I, you know, I haven't been collecting for that long. I mean, it's been 2017, 2018, so a couple of years, but um, that's all it takes is a couple of years of knowing what's fake and knowing what's real and you're, and you're, you're good. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you eventually learn and, you know, like, get into the hang of everything especially fakes i mean like ramirez manson bundy it's pretty easy to tell those you know signatures especially warnos at least for me because i have a stack of you know warnos or ramirez whatever it's but then there's those like obscure like Iceman or whoever like you gotta yeah. do some digging to see if this is legit or not like especially like if you're forking out 1700 dollars, you better make sure that's a hundred percent. Make sure it's real. Real, yeah. 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 And I can tell you another thing. Iceman is not going to find be seventeen hundred dollars. It's going to be more than that. Yeah. That's a name yeah, that you never see. I yeah. Mean, I I don't know if I've ever seen a maybe one time. I want to I want to say maybe one time, but maybe even not. I don't know if I've ever seen a, an Iceman signature like you. I, I I think, but um, I know they're probably out there because he seemed like the type of guy that would respond to the letters. <laughs> They're probably yeah. out there, but they're just no one, you know, they're so rare. So, you know, it's, um, it's a, it's a cruel hobby sometimes, but, you know, you, you know it, everybody, 
like I said, it's hazing. If you don't get scammed, you're, <laughs> you know, you're not, you haven't been in it for a long time because everybody gets scammed. <laughs> right, right. This is how it is. Well, but, shoot, I think we can, uh, I think we can yeah, end it here. I love it though. I love it. It's, do we freeze again? There we go. Oh, um, no, we're here. Uh, yeah, it, it froze just a second, but we're good now. Um, I love it. I love the hobby. It's, I'm so glad I got into it. It's my, it's like my passion. I've been, you know, I, I try to communicate a lot with you and other, the big name collectors and it's, um, you basically, you guys are the only ones I, you see, I kind of stick with like a few websites and a few names. And that's basically who I stick with trading and buying from because anything beyond that, I don't, I don't really know, you know, the people, right. but I've been, dealing you know i've been dealing with you and for a couple of years now so you know it's um it's it's my it's my thing <laughs> it's kind of what i'm known for actually <laughs> like at my job literally people know me as the guy who writes <laughs> the guy who writes serial killers but um yeah and anybody who's thinking about it should i should i start or should i not start you should start if you have the means to now don't bankrupt yourself but if you have the means to do it, you should definitely start because it's cool. It's cool. And the people are cool. The the good people, you know, the the, the legit people are cool. So Yeah, it's definitely know. a fun and, and an interesting hobby, you know, to to say the least. And definitely will uh brighten up your social life. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing something to your social life. <laughs> Whether you're killing it or making it better, that's that's you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tomato, tomato. You know? Right. But um, um, yeah, <clears throat> and I, yeah, I'm I'm very thankful that you invited me to do a video with you. It's yeah, really thank cool. you. Thank you. I I know we've been trying to schedule for a while, but I'm glad that we finally knocked it out. And, you know, in the near future, we could probably, you know, do another and another and another because I know your collection's, you know, growing pretty big and whatnot. So I, um, I would love to do just hit me up and I'll do any videos with you. I enjoy it. It not only helps you because it's another video for your channel, you know, it gives me more clout or it gives me and it puts my name out there. So you know, it's a it's a win win for both of us. So um, I've been doing a lot of uh, well, I've I've done a couple videos with um, Bizarre Bizarre on YouTube. He's um, I don't know, have you heard of him? Yeah, 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 he's, yeah. I know who he is, Mikey. Yeah, yeah, he's a good dude. Yeah, he's pretty pretty cool, pretty cool guy. And um, him and I have been collaborating with a bunch of videos. And um, go follow his page on YouTube. Go give him a, a like and however YouTube works. Go do that and um and follow you know all your stuff anybody listening I, i'm sure if you're listening to your you're probably already following your stuff but anybody who's listening to this video follow his page because awesome guy great and if you're getting into the hobby he's legit you know so everybody you know that's cool it's cool and i and follow my page true crime murderbilia on youtube or not youtube on facebook and true crime obsessive also and that's all my that's all my plugs for today i'm done <laughs>